Welcome to the Global Roundtable organized by the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Today we have the pleasure to converse with John Bauermaster, environmentalist, ocean expert and filmmaker. Welcome John. Yeah, thank you Natasha. It's really a pleasure to have you here again with us. You were with us last year at the Environmental Film Festival and you got to know a little bit what we do in the area of environmental filmmaking. And, and, and I saw most of the country. And you've traveled around the country and presented your movie and talked about different environmental issues to audiences ranging from children to adults to seniors to experts and non-experts. Yeah, I, I think, think we, showed, we showed a movie about the Galapagos that I had made. Correct. Correct. But I would like to introduce you, first of all, maybe to our audiences who don't know all things about you, and there are many of them. So uh, I'd like to say uh, that John Bauermaster is a noted ocean expert and longtime grantee of the National Geographic Expeditions Council. He's the founder of the Oceans 8 project, which is a 10 year long series of expeditions around the world's oceans. Born out of his desire to study the health of the oceans and the nearly 3 billion people who depend on them, Oceans 8 enabled John and his team of photographers, scientists and filmmakers to reach rarely seen corners of the world and provide the public with much needed and unique information about the state of the world's ocean. The latest films from John and his team continue to garner praise. Let's mention some of them. Terra Antarctica, documenting a six week long exploration of the Antarctic Peninsula by sail and sea kayak, which won Best Oceans Issues Award from the Blue Ocean Film Festival. His other feature, What Would Darwin Think? Man versus Nature in the Galapagos, showcases the impact of tourism over the wildlife reserve that is Galapagos and was also awarded the best environmental film at the Vancouver International Film Festival and was screened, as we mentioned last year, at the DREF, what we call DREF, DR Environmental Film Festival in Santo Domingo, organized by Global Foundation. And John's latest film, The Governor Cuomo is a concert protest film which uh, deals with the issue of fracking in New York State. So these are some of the areas of your work, some of the themes you have tackled in the last few years. But my first question for you, John, would be how did this interest in environment start? How did this interest in ocean start? How did the interest in the adventure start? And when did the filmmaking come along? <coughs> That's a, a <laughs> few questions. Well, let's see. The, the, I'm a little bit surprised myself because I grew up in the very center of the United States. I was born actually in normal Illinois, um, not anywhere near an ocean. My parents were not adventurous. I've never been on an airplane with my parents. We didn't have that kind of life. But I think what inspired me to pursue a life of, of ad adventure was something very simple, reading. Wow. I was a voracious reader and I read. That's a good message for young audiences Absolutely. nowadays who believe that all the knowledge comes only from the movies. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, th th that point, uh, books were my only option, so. Right. Uh, and uh, kind of the classical boys stuff, like Jack London and er Ernest Hemingway and, and uh, on and on and on. But that inspired me to be curious about yeah. uh, the, the remote corners of, of the world. I was also pretty lucky because at 15 I, did, I kind of knew what I wanted to be, which was a writer. I initially thought I would be a sports reporter, you know, go to a baseball park and write about baseball or something, but I tried that when I was in university and it was very boring, so. Um, well, compared to traveling to Antarctica. That's right. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the gold seal of approval in, in travel and writing is uh, to work for the National Geographic, so I focused on, on the society pretty early on. And at a pretty young age, I was still in my 30s, I got my first assignment from National Geographic to write about a, a dog sled expedition that was going to cross Antarctica. Uh, as a first assignment. Yeah, as a first Straight assignment. Straight to Antarctica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my, my, my relationship with National Geographic started in Antarctica, and that was uh, 11, 26, 27 years ago. And now I've just finished my first 3D movie all about Antarctica, which is going to premiere at the National Geographic. So on it's the, premiering on the now in March yeah. this year. Yeah. And it's the first 3D movie on Antarctica. Yes. 
How is it different from other movies you've done yourself on Antarctica and other people have done? How, what would you say? Well, actually, yeah, I'd made a film previously about Antarctica, and to be honest, the 3D movie is not that different. What's different from any other film that exists in that kind of giant screen uh, genre, I mean, th th our mov movie is going to spend the next 10 years, uh, next 10 to 20 years in museums around the world showing. Mm -hmm. um, but what it addresses are things that when people made movies about Antarctica 10 years ago and 20 years ago, never thought of, which is the impact of climate change, uh, you know, the loss of uh, ice and its impact on wildlife, uh, you know, the, the notion that once that ice along the peninsula uh, disappears or starts to disappear, it will make resource development much easier, oil, coal, gas, just like we're seeing in the Arctic. Right. You know, we have a tendency to think of Antarctica as being super remote and far away, which it is, but also and we... And huge and virgin, which is not so huge anymore and not so virgin anymore. Yeah. Well, it's still pretty pristine, but when you think about where Antarctica came from, the land underneath all that ice, it broke off from South America and, and uh, South Africa, and the land is filled with, with, with minerals and natural resources, and we, yes. you know, we're a hungry population and you know if, if a growing population that's right and you know as that as the human population edges towards nine billion uh, there's still going to be great demands for oil and and coal and who knows antarctica could one day you know in the next 50 to 100 years become a new new source for that so you've actually witnessed what has been happening to antarctica your first trip to antarctica was in 1989 so. 1989 so yeah. now it's been 11 14 years 15 years almost right i think so longer 1989 20 25, 25 25 okay years. we can do the math <laughs> together <right>. <laughs> Uh, well, wow! So well, you have seen, you have seen. I've seen what it has physically been changed. When you know, when when they went and and started this dog sled trip, they actually started on frozen ice on the ocean, which had been there for thousands and tens of thousands of years, and that ice is no longer there, for example. And but yes, I've been back almost every year for the last dozen years or so, and you can see al along the peninsula. I don't want, one, one thing I'm always cautious of though is that Antarctica is a huge continent. Parts of it are actually getting colder. But that skinny little peninsula, about 900 miles long, that sticks out from the peninsula and, right. and up towards Chile and Argentina is warming faster than anywhere else on the planet. So what would be your message? I, I want to use it not, don't tell us the whole story of the movie, but like a little trailer, like a little preview. What would be your message? for audiences interested in the movie or for anybody interested about Antarctica right now? Right. Well, it is, you know, we have this, this vision in our head that, rem that Antarctica is the rem most remote, the most cold, the most foreboding, uh, tough place. But it's actually all of those things, but also it's fragile and has a, an ecosystem, you know, of wildlife and that depends on, on consistency and that all of that is, is at some risk today and is, is changing. It also, you know, it's the only place on the planet that is successfully governed by international treaty. Right. Up till now, at least, it's been Yeah, yeah. It's and it, it, it works. You know, it's, now, it's a little easier to have global consensus in a place where there are no people. Right. It's a lot easier than Israel-Palestine, mm -hmm. for example. Um, right. But it does, does provide a model of how you know nations can join together and work and together. work together on and you know because the only people who really go to Antarctica are scientists, which is supported by all the signatories of the of the Antarctic Treaty, of which there are I think forty nine or something. Mm. So how did your uh, interest in the environment start? You mentioned the adventure that comes from the books traveling and when did your environmental awareness really start growing and becoming a major theme because we can see that now you're dealing with fracking which is not necessarily connected to the adventure itself or the beauty of the land it's a purely environmental protection message yeah. i'm a big fan of of adventure for adventure's sake you know people going out and climbing a mountain or running a river or you know, and then testing themselves personally. I think everyone who has that desire should do that. Absolutely, it's very... What, what it do you think it brings to a person? Well, it gives, it, it teaches you so much about yourself and what your limits are and, and what your, you know, your ability to work with a team, 
or if you're traveling alone to do things in independently. I think that's great, but that's like a, 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 on, the, on the stage of the learning curve, that's something you should do in your 20s, maybe 30s. But by that point, you, if you're gonna go out and kind of explore the world, especially via adventure, I think you have to bring, be bringing back stories that are bigger than just personal adventure. I think you, you're obligated in this day and age to bring back stories about the changing culture, history, politics, and environment of these places so you go. So through your experience in the nature and everything you've conquered on a personal level and on a universal level by exploring, you become responsible in a way. That's right. To share with other people yeah, that, and develop a, a message. That's what I feel my obligation is. And pretty quickly, you know, in, the, in that same kind of 25 years ago stage, uh, I was doing lots of uh, explorations of rivers, for example, and I got quite into the issue of hydroelectricity and, and, and rivers and the impact of, of, of hydro plants on populations, et cetera. Um, but th that was a great example of using adventure, going out and, and you know, having a great river trip but, and then meeting the people who lived along the river and then talking about the future of the place if a, a, a hydropower plant came in, for example. And that then led into that Oceans 8 project, which you described, where we literally over the course of 10 years traveled around the world one continent at a time, looking at kind of an emblematic coastline as a clue to how that continent was dealing with ocean issues. So how did you come back home to New York, where you live, I understand, and decide to do your last film on fracking? Well, it, there was another step in the middle. We, I had made this series for National Geographic of these Ocean's 8 films, and I then decided I wanted to do something closer to home, so uh, I was th wanted to make a movie about the relationship between man and water, and I thought, in the United States, where's the best place? And so uh, we went to Louisiana. Yes. We, we, we spent a couple years filming in Louisiana, kind of what I called uh, envir these uh, water stories, Louisiana water stories. And you know, that felt good because it was the first film I'd made in 10 years in the United States. And then a couple years ago, we stepped, got even closer uh, because I live in, the, in, in upstate New York and decided that I would make a film about my own backyard where this, uh, hydraulic, this fight over hydraulic fracturing was, was very controversial, you know. Um, fracking has become the most divisive issue in New York State in, in, in the recent in recent. So tell history. us a little bit, I'm sure that many of the people who watch this uh, conversation know about fracking, but probably many haven't heard. As you mentioned when we talked before, that even after screening the movie, many people who are very knowledgeable, intellectuals, well-read, come to you and say, well, I've discovered fracking for the first time, I didn't know what it is. So how would you say, like, briefly, to somebody who really doesn't understand the term. What, what is it and what are the challenges that it involves? Yeah. Well, f you know, the, the people who are pro-fracking will tell you that the process has been being done since the late 1940s. It involves uh, drilling down and uh, exploding, essentially, via high pressure, uh, massive amounts of water and, and increasingly chemicals as a way to break up the shale to release both natural gas and oil. It's, an, it's kind of an evolution in drilling. Um, but it only became really popular in, in fr initially in the United States about 10 years ago, going back uh, maybe 15 years ago, as oil men in Texas kept experimenting with the process, refining the process. Laws changed in Washington to allow it. They, they made exemptions for it in the Clean Water Act, the Clean, yes. the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act to allow these, these kind of experiments to go on because you're pumping all sorts of fresh water, four to nine million gallons per, per frack and another 50,000 gallons of chemicals. Every time you frack, you're pumping that all under the ground and the, the gas and oil industry needed some exemptions in order to, to... So you're using the water for fracking, which means that a very valuable resource is being used in the process and you're also polluting the water in the area that impacts the lives of families in a very short, the results actually felt pretty quickly. Yeah, it, but it's a very young uh, extraction process. We don't know a lot about what the impacts of it, long-term impacts both to, to human health and the health of the environment. But it's pretty easy, I think, to see that if you take 50,000 gallons of chemicals, many of which are known carcinogens, and you pump them under the water, you uh, pump them under the ground, you mix them with millions of 
gallons of water, and much of that then comes back, some of it stays underground, much of it comes back up and then out of the ground. They don't really have a solution for what to do with it, that there, is, there are going to be some serious environmental concerns. Yeah. But, you know, there is a rush in, in the United States and around the world for, uh, for energy independence. And right. the gas and oil industry and the politicians have decided that this fracking boom, which has released all sorts of, you know, a significant amount of, of oil and gas from previous uh, deposits that, that, that they thought were inaccessible, they think that that will provide us with some kind of long-term energy plan. The reality is it's a very, very short-term plan. And then there is also this uh, motto that we hear very often how gas is much cleaner than oil. So is it cleaner? No, th and that, you know, many environmentalists actually, when natural, these discoveries of natural gas were announced, many environmentalists and green thinkers jumped on board because they bought into that natural gas is cleaner than coal. Right. That was the argument. Because coal is very dirty. Right. Natural gas is dirty, but natural gas is, is, is methane. And methane is a much more dangerous contributor to, to climate change than even coal. So every time that natural ga gas comes out of the ground, at the well site, when it's transferred to trucks and pipelines, every time it leaks, it contributes to climate change in a much more serious way. So in the long term, it's actually not cleaner. It's, it's, an, it, you know, it's, it's yet another fossil fuel. You know. And also with the fracking, when you calculate in all the pollution that's being done in the process, right. even if it were cleaner, it doesn't make it clean, right. does it? No, so, you know, and, and the, the governments in the United States and now increasingly around the country are subsidizing the gas and oil industry to, to help them drill. Now, my argument is if, if we took those billions and billions and billions of dollars that are going into subsidies and going into research for fracking and put those monies into renewables and into conservation, we'd be way ahead because it's now clear that the, the gas and oil that's in this, these shale deposits aren't going to last forever. No, they're not, you know, the initial claims were they would, that, that the, these were re reserves that were going to support us for 100 years or 160 years or 200 years. The reality is it's 10 years, maybe, maybe 20 years, maximum. And then it's gone, and then it's out, and now, and we've done nothing to plan for the future. For the future, and yeah. still, I think you mentioned it in your movie that International Energy Agency says we only have five more years left. Yeah, at, at this kind of to actually produce a change, otherwise it's almost irreversible. In terms of climate change. In terms yeah. of climate yeah, yeah, change. Yeah. So we're we're very short-sighted. You know, we it, we we get kind of hoodwinked, uh, fooled a little bit by uh, some of the promoters in, in, the, in, in the energy industry who, you know, to be quite honest, are, are not looking after our best interests, but are looking after the best interests of their stockholders. But good message that your movie, uh, Dear Governor Cuomo, puts forward, and I was very impressed. Uh, it's not a negative movie. It's not a movie that makes you depressed. It's not a movie that makes you angry either. It, uh, what it conveys, more or less, is a message that people working together with goodwill and working for the best interest of everybody can produce a change. You have in that movie, in the concert that was organized in upstate New York, you have put together scientists, um, stars like Natalie Merchant, Mark Ruffalo, or Melissa Leo. Uh, you have put together simple people, uh, everybody, even politicians. They are all coming together for a common purpose. And they're expressing their interest that the change might, should, and has to happen. Why do you think is change so slow? Yeah. Or is it slow, let me ask you. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I've been watching this fracking issue across the United States pretty closely for the last two to three years. And it's I was stunned just a year ago how uneducated the American public was regarding fracking. But just in the last year, I've seen hundreds of grassroots groups mm -hmm. sprouting up across the country. In, in every state, they frack in 34 states, and there are now grassroots groups in, in, all, in all those states. Because you know, when the, when the gas industry and oil industry started fracking, they didn't come into town and put up big billboards and announce we're fracking. They did it very secretly. So it's taken a while for the public to catch on to exactly what's going on in, the, in their backyard. Right. And now that they've caught on, it doesn't matter if you live in a trailer park or a $4 million house. If, it's in your, if, it, if fracking is being done 
in your neighborhood, that means your, your water and your air are, are very much at risk of contamination. Well, there are many movies. I watched Promised Land yeah. and, and uh, a Gas Land. So there are many movies being made lately. Yeah. And I think you're also one of the people who are a big believer in the power of media and film to change people's minds and bring better policies. All right. And you've lived it through your work. Can yeah. you tell us about it? Well, you know, I, I'm like everybody else. On Friday night, I, I, if I turn on Netflix, you know, I want to watch something to be entertained. You know, I, uh, I make documentary films, but uh, if, if I'm looking at a list of documentary films to watch, often I'll pass on them because most of them are very depressing. Mm -hmm. So I think the goal of, of, of good documentaries is to kind of to entertain and to energize. And I think that's where... To uh, energize. Yeah, I think that... that ener ener and, and the people who, you know, who've committed their lives to working on these issues, when they saw our film, Dear Governor Cuomo, they got re-energized. They were reminded that they're not out there alone that there is a, a growing community of people who agree with them. And, and, and by agreeing with them, it just means that you're asking questions. So your next move is going to be, dear President Obama, to take this whole view of fracking, challenge it imposes, the effects it produces in communities, and the ways it should be or could be regulated or banned to the national level. What, what are we going to look forward to? Well, in Dear Governor Cuomo, which was dwelt only on the issue in New York State, we weren't cr super critical of the governor. We just in asked him to join the anti-fracking majority, which is growing in New York. And with President Obama, he's, he's been very much for natural gas development. He's, he, even though he's never said the word fracking, at least not in public, he's for fracking. And we just want to show him that even though he's not going to run for office again, he will have an environmental legacy. And I'm not sure that he's going to want to be saddled with uh, you know, the, the, the long-term contaminations that fracking is going to create as his environmental legacy. I think he might want to th rethink that and might, might want to offer to his successor, whoever he or she might be, that maybe they should look at, at, at this fracking issue differently. Differently. Well, thank you so much, John, for taking your time and conversing with us. And we are really looking forward and wishing you all the luck and all the best with your next projects that we are all looking forward to watching. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you for watching the Global Roundtable organized by the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Today, we had the pleasure of the company of John Bauermaster environmental scientist, ocean expert, and filmmaker.